Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. So this is our second event that we've done in this sort of series. We're hoping to do one of these once a month, at least for this year. We'll see how it goes. Um, Steps Collective stands for Shirley Easy Place to Start. You see what we did here. Sort of hijacked. Not really co-branded, though. We probably need to work on that box. Um, and hopefully you already kind of know roughly what the theme of the, the, the event is because you've all read something somewhere online or you, I've shared something with you. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of combination of myself, um, John at the back there, Rob over here, and then we've got Emily and Lizzie who aren't with us today, I think. So um, but yeah, there's a few of us. If you are interested in sort of speaking at an, another, uh, an event in the future, do let us know. Um, if you're also... I've lost control of my screen. Hold on. If you also, this is super abstract, but if you also want to sign up to the mailing list or anything like that, we'll, we, we're recording the video so you can uh, get access to the slate roll. But that'll take us to uh, an email sign up link. We can kind of find out when the next events can be called. You speak at the moment, all that sort of stuff. So that's that. Um, We've got two speakers today, but what we like to do, even though, like I say, I think you kind of already know why you're here because you've read something, but we do have a few words that we like to show at the start just to kind of remind us why we've sort of come together with this event and why we think it's useful. And I'll sort of give you a riff of those words now, so sort of slightly riffing on the time. I asked you to do the bit that Lizzie made us do last time. Oh, yeah, feel free to close your eyes if you want a more immersive experience while I read these words, if you know, if you feel so inclined to do so. Um, so if there's one thing we all share in common as we navigate the transitional times we're in, is that there's not always an obvious and easy path to follow. Even the most experienced travellers in the regenerative space mentioned they are continually finding their way, uncertain of what is around the next bend or over the next peak. It's an ongoing dance with uncertainty, switching between action and inspiration, moving before we think too much and thinking before we go too far. So although the, the taking the first steps can often feel like the hardest, hearing about the journeys of others doing the same can be a vital part of our own. We help each other towards a regenerative future, not necessarily as experts, but as parents, neighbours, colleagues and citizens. And all our stories are unique. So that's our kind of little flavour of yeah, why we're here. We're going to hear from two people, about 15, 20 minutes each. Um, and then we save plenty of time at the end for sort of questions. I'd say it's like more conversational than probably like a Q and A. It's not necessarily like trying to grill grill the people that have shared with us, but much more like an open dialogue. What what what's surfacing for you from what you've heard? What reflections do you have? Just provoke any sort of questions at you. But yeah, so feel free to um, make some notes or retain some thoughts as we go through because we'll save that all the way to the end. So don't forget what the first speaker said. Uh, and with that in mind, I think I can hand over to you, Katie, to start us off. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to also time myself to make sure that I don't go too over. You can cut, feel free to cut in, Andy. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation and it's lovely to be here. I love the idea. I didn't get the steps thing, so now I, I, didn't, I didn't notice that, so I now understand. Um, Yes, I was yeah asked to come to kind of share a little bit of my journey. Um, I hope it's somehow coherent for you, but I will. I'm happy to kind of answer any questions or elaborate afterwards. But I guess kind of my very um, non-commercial pitch is of who I am is someone who's kind of trying to change the narrative or our understanding a better economic system, so that I can contribute in my own small way to helping solve what some are now calling the meta crisis. It's my very um, short elevator pitch, I guess. Um, so I've got three questions that I'm, I'm here to answer, a little bit about who I am and where I came from, where I come from, what sent me on this direction and what signals and signs I might be able to, to offer others. Um, so who am I? I like to use this title. I still use this title. I'm kind of a recovering mainstream economist and a mother. Um, I was about 15 years, uh, 15 years, the first 15 years of my career as a researcher and a consultant um, to lots of large multinational corporations. I held various senior roles and titles, did a lot of travel. 
um, was kind of in your in a classic kind of corporate corporate world for for the most part of my career. And around the last uh, six years or so up to now, um, I've done a, a pretty radical, I've taken a pretty radical step away from the, the profit world and the corporate world. And I now uh, spend most of my time involved in policy and advocacy work and community organizing. And I guess kind of the career part of what I do is in education and increasingly in storytelling, um, in writing and 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 podcasting and, and creating stories. I came from, I said, where have I come from? I thought, I don't know whereabouts everyone here in this room is. I was thinking, what are the kind of the pictures of, of the environment that I grew up in that kind of maybe also led me into that first part of my path? So I'm you know, from uh, just outside Glasgow, grew up in kind of 80s Thatcher, Britain. Um, I, my grandfather was a coal miner, so we had the, the kind of miner strikes, we had the poll tax strike, we had this kind of upheaval shifting from this industrial era into kind of collapse of industry, collapse of welfare, welfare state, the rise of financial capitalism, um, yuppieism, but also kind of violence and hooliganism and a real kind of sense that we were kind of like on our own now, yeah? So the narrative that I grew up with was, you got to go to uni, you got to get a decent job, you got to get a decent job and not be dependent on a man as well. So that was also important uh, as a woman, right? It had to become independent, had to get it all. And, and importantly, you have to get on the housing ladder, right? So you've got to earn enough to do that. So that was kind of what I did. Um, I studied business, not because I was really interested in business, but because I thought that was how I would get a job, which actually did work out in that way. Um, I probably was more interested in the arts, but I, I took that path. And 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 yeah, that was kind of the, the where where I was coming from. So why did I get sort of then 15 years into my career to deciding to shift direction? There were a couple of signs. Um, being an economist, obviously, um, the financial crash um, was a bit of a wake up call, realizing that we didn't see it coming. Um, and then the austerity that came out from that and thinking, why are we making kind of people pay for the mistakes of, of these bankers? And within that as well, having children, which I think for many people does 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 um, create a shift in your priorities. But there was one sort of sign in particular, one of those kind of knock on head moments that I just want to briefly, briefly um, talk about because it gives a little bit of context to where I ended up going. And it was a presentation from a climate scientist. So I'd started to become aware of the climate crisis. I'd even gone to back to university and done a master's in environmental economics to kind of hopefully figure out what to do. And that I hadn't really had on my radar just how serious it was. And there was a number and then a chart that were particularly impactful to me. And this was the number. Um, 66%. This was the this is what the climate scientists, just after the Paris Climate Agreement, that everyone was kind of cheering about. We'd finally got all the world governments around the table to agree to solve uh global warming. Um, and this was the probability. Um, that scientists uh, estimated uh, we would have of managing to keep below that kind of safe threshold of 1.5 degrees. You may have heard of that if you're in the room. Many of you, I guess, have um, to it, this what, what we call basically the carbon budget, the amount of carbon we have left to burn to stay below 1.5 degrees and on that on that pathway to net zero. And and he and he sort of said this phrase: "We know. Well, would you would you put your child in a plane?" Uh, with the odds, with those odds of a safe landing, and and I was thinking, and up until that point, I'd been aware of the climate crisis. I was an environmental economist. I'd sort of read the reports, but for some reason, this sort of this sort of framing hadn't really hadn't really hit me. I was thinking, why? Why is it not a hundred percent? Why have we left it so late that the best that we can do is offer our kids a sixty six percent chance that we will. That even if we do everything, if we get we get to net zero by twenty fifty, that that's the best that we can do, and so that really stuck with me, and that that played on me for I guess quite a while actually. And then another, this was the other chart that that uh, that he during the same presentation, um, the scientist said we we should have listened to the limits to growth, and I was sort of well, what's the limits to growth? Why have I never heard of this? I'm an economist. I work with kind of charts. I work with, you know, with 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 data all the time. Why have I not heard of this report? And um, if you've not heard of it, actually, it was in the news again recently because there's been an update which shows that we're kind of on this on this pathway. This has taken 
from this is a stylized version of the of the original report in 1972. Um, and it shows, uh, just kind of briefly uh, explain here what's going on. This was a model from some scientists at MIT uh, in the early 70s. And, they, and they, they built this basically model of the world where they put in all the dynamics of the of the Earth system, the resources that we have, the amount of food we need to feed ourselves, what industry, what materials we need for industry, how much pollution is being created, and and the impact that that could have on the population. And based on their scenarios, they 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 put forward that well, if we keep going as we're doing, by around the middle of this century, we're going to destroy what we need for a good life. We're going to create so much pollution, and we're going to destroy the natural world that we're going to create this collapse in in the population and civilization and if you've looked at kind of reports on tipping points and the climate niche um or the planetary boundaries um the evidence is that we, we're kind of following this this pathway and i was just so shocked that i'd never heard of it so together with this realization that we were really far away from kind of our climate goals and and then this other uh this uh, this other work that had been done 50 years ago um, the book was called Limits to Growth. And, and I'm thinking, why hadn't I heard of it? But also in particular, why as an economist had I never heard of it? Because this is basically a model of our economic system. So this sent me down a rabbit hole um, where I got into learning about systems thinking. Maybe some of you in the room know more about this than I do. But for me, this was completely new. Um, I'd never been thought to think in this way about the world in this interconnected way. Um, I got into learned about all about the Club of Rome, Jay Forrester, who was the who's the founder of Systems Dynamics at MIT, had done all this work in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And for some reason it was just completely not on my radar. Learned about the report um, that was brought before Congress in the early 70s. So the world's governments knew about this research and um, I wanted to understand why I hadn't learned about it. And it also opened me up to, to Daniela Meadows, who's kind of now known as the founder of Systems Thinking. And after sort of thinking about this for a while and, and teaming up with someone else who'd been at that at that workshop with me, I decided that I wanted to learn more about this. Um, and I felt, and my research into this led me to the conclusion that really mainstream economists have led us down the wrong track for the last 50 years and more people need to know about this. And I need to do what I can uh, to help them to help people understand this. So that led into the one hand in developing uh this this story. So I created with my with my colleague Begard a, a kind of a, a three-part documentary about the true story of limits to growth. Um, because we wanted through the power of storytelling to try to to try to alert people and, and, and make people more aware of it. And it's turned out to be um one way that I was able to make an impact. We had We've a, a lot of people listen to it. We're now exploring translations, um, getting it on onto other other platforms and so on. So, what signals, I guess, can I leave you for? Uh, can I leave for others? I I kind of try to put this into two categories. So, there's things that I've learned that help me make better sense of the world, and I really think that if we want to play a, a role in solving uh, the crisis, that it. It, we need to have a kind of a better understanding. Maybe this is useful for you, maybe you already know it. And then some of the things that have helped me in my path, things that I kind of had to do in order to go from the kind of old world that I was in into this world. Um, so two things that I think that as many people as possible need to try to do is we need to unlearn economics. And even though I know not everyone studied economics, the language of economics and the mental models of economics, I think, are much more ingrained in our culture and in our society than we even realise. I think many people talk in economic terms all the time without even realising it. And we need to learn systems thinking. So maybe this is obvious for some people here. This wasn't for me. Um, the economics view of the world is um, reductionist. It views problems in isolation. It views the climate crisis as a problem in isolation. Um, and it seeks to optimize and maximize efficiency. In so doing, continuing to create more and more crises um, because, because in making one thing more efficient, we then turn and use those resources uh, somewhere else. Um, it presents, it's based on one worldview and it ignores the values, cultures, and all the different, even finding some other academic fields. And this leads to this culture of arrogance, which I think is also very, unfortunately, very prevalent uh, in, in particularly in our culture, in our Western culture. And what it also does, and I think this is one of the reasons it's not been reformed, uh, and which is 
an area of, of research that I'm now interested in exploring is it upholds the status quo. So in order to get away from this, as many people as possible, I think, need to learn systems thinking because it helps us understand connections, causes and feedbacks. And systems thinking is all about is the opposite from that 66% probability that we have of, of, of solving things. It seeks to stabilize and build resiliency. A systems thinker, anyone with this kind of way of looking at the world would never take such a risk. It's all about building resiliency and stability and stability. And this is these are just not in our vocabulary right now. We're still talking about optimizing, maximizing efficiency, maximizing productivity. And I think it also what it also requires of us is to be constantly allow yourself to be constantly challenged and constantly have your world be challenged. It requires humility, something that I feel like so many people are missing, especially in the economists that I uh, that I some of them are still my friends, <laughs> maybe maybe not, not not as many as before. Oh, ultimately, it requires us then also to challenge the status quo, which can be a hard thing to do. So what are some personal things, uh, personal signs and signals? So for me, um, you know, coming back to like where I came from and the message and, you know, you have to go out and get a job and earn good money and get all those titles and status was letting purpose and not status drive you. I went off on a rabbit hole. I gave up a lot of paid job opportunities. I stopped doing work for corporations to kind of follow what I thought was really important was telling this story. Um, and so it was really hard to let go, but it freed me to focus on doing what I can where I think it makes sense. And I've also applied that now to other areas. I still do a lot of volunteer work. I still teach a lot for free. I'm active in my local community. I'm not always doing, I think the old homo economicus in me would have said, well, that's an opportunity cost. You should be using every hour that you're working to make the most money. But that's not something um, that drives me anymore. And I'm glad to be freed of that. And learning humility and gratitude, I think, um, again, understanding that that none of us are self-made and the world doesn't owe us anything. I know this is kind of cliched, but we we really do owe the, owe the world. And and this having grown up in this kind of 90s, no sense of purpose, everyone just going for it, all about making money. This is something that I had to learn and internalize. And I think this is something that more well. I think something that, that can be very helpful. And again, this maybe sounds a little bit cliched, but really connecting with people and also nature. I didn't grow up in a place that was very close to nature. And I'm very lucky now to live in, in, in Austria, just outside of Vienna. And it's very green here. And I try to be in the forest every day. And I think this really has helped me, not just with my own health, but when you are connected and in nature every day, you just automatically then value it more and it will help you also from choosing degenerative and exploitative pathways. So those are my signals and maybe just a couple of quotes to end on that I found helpful. I always like Jill, Gil Scott Heron, um, the revolution will not make you slim or go better with coke. Um, this isn't about status anymore. Um, when I was researching Jay Forrester, who built that world model, um, which was used for the limits to growth, one of his former students said he used to tell people, if you can't tell me how your thesis is going to make the world a better place, go away and work on it until you can. And when I was studying economics, th it was never about that. It was just about do your degree, go out and get your job. And then finally, from Danella Meadows, um, if you've read Leverage Points, um, Places to Intervene in the System, one of her most famous works, this is something that I use now to guide the work that I'm doing, is that you keep pointing at the anom anomalies and failures in the old paradigm. You keep speaking louder and with assurance from the new one. You insert people with the new paradigm in places of public visibility and power. You don't waste time with reactionaries, rather. You work with active change agents and with a vast middle ground of people who are open-minded. And thank you for listening. And then we're going to hear from Lisa. Everyone wants to welcome Lisa. Um, there we go. Hi. You. Thank you. That was great. There are already so many parallels there. So I'm Lisa Merritt Lawless. I'm one of the co founders of Purpose Disruptors. Um, my background is in marketing advertising. So 10 years kind of client side, working for brands like Coca Cola, um, and then 10 years sort of agency side and creative agencies. Um, yeah. So. <clears throat> uh, when I was 12, I had uh, two sorts of posters on the wall in my bedroom uh, on the left-hand side. 
posters of Greenpeace and the Rainbow Warrior and uh, everything to do with nature and animals. Um, and on the other wall, everything to do with brands and fashion. Um, and those are my two passions and things I care most about in the world. Nature, connection, animals, and then fashion and brands. And they could exist, sort of coexist in my mind and in my bedroom. Um, and there was no sort of conflict with that. Um, fast forward sort of 20 years, uh, the last project I worked on um, for brands um, was launching a UK beauty brand in the US market with like, you know, Steve Ioki on the decks and Emily Ratajowski in the beauty boudoir and um, at the Fontainebleau in Miami. So this was kind of what my world had become, flying back kind of business class. Um, and that was all wonderful and great in 2018 um, until... Uh, this kind of happened so very similar to Katie started to connect the sort of climate crisis started to think about what that meant um, in terms of my work and it's fair to say uh, it all came tumbling down um, in fact I sort of realized I think that I was carrying on sort of um, working <clears throat> doing what I was doing with this in the background and I'd somehow managed to sort of compartmentalize them into different parts of my brain um, in order to continue doing that um, so Q sort of existential crisis breakdown. Um, and I guess there were three big things that led to my sort of change in my path. Um, the first was my daughter, this is her when she was 12, <laughs> going on her first climate march. Um, so inspired by Bre Greta and many other students, although she was very young, you know, she could see how she needed to be involved in sort of um, shaping the future. So that was the first thing. Um, the second thing um, was the agency I was working at. Uh, suddenly a new client sort of snuck into the building. Uh, I'm the poodle here, uh, <laughs> where everybody seemed to be okay with that. And I was like, are we, are we, are we, are we okay with this? Like, I'm genuinely not okay with this. Um, and so even though I had helped them grow from a startup to a 20 strong uh, agency and I was their strategy director and on the senior leadership team, I quit. Um, so with no job and nothing to do, I decided I needed to retrain and re-educate myself. And similar to Katie, uh, working out like, what do you actually do now, given you've worked in marketing and advertising your whole life? So um, bumped into this lovely man, Jonathan Moyes, uh, who I'd worked with on a strategy project like many moons ago. He was running a course called Retaming Agency, um, which changed my life. So this is us sat in a circle um, at Ball Place on a sort of six-month programme. Uh, the beginning of which was learning about climate, climate science and understanding a bit about systems change and starting to think like actually what is this whole new kind of world um, and I think from there I felt it on like a personal level and I realised uh, that I needed to do something differently and the one question I came from the weekend uh, with was how can I help and that's probably still what I hold kind of closely um, along with this quote from Michael Berry which is once our personal connection to what is wrong becomes clear, then we have to choose. We can go on as before, recognising the dishonesty and living with it the best we can, or we can begin the effort to change the way we live and think. I decided to take the latter eat uh, and decided to change everything. I swapped kind of uh, holidays um, that were... Oh, this is good side. That one. Oh, no. OK. Um, so, sorry, this is the end shot of the Truman Show, um, and I think... This is the only way I've been able to explain what this moment in my life felt like, uh, which was I didn't know about systems. I didn't know I was part of a system. I certainly didn't know I was in a system and there was like something outside of it. And it's a bit like at the end where he realises the whole thing is a construct. It's all a set and actually it's all made up. Um, and actually suddenly for the first time you can see it. And that's what I felt, which was like, oh, my God, there's this whole thing I've been part of. And actually I can choose to not be part of that anymore. Um, so I swapped kind of faraway holidays for my local reservoir. Um, I gave up fat shopping for clothes for a whole year. I turned to a plant-based diet, made lots of changes in my own personal life. And then it came to sort of earning money. Like, how was I going to work? What was I going to do? How was I going to earn money? I have a mortgage and three kids. Um, and so I thought that the answer was to go and work for a more ethical agency. So I went and worked in a creative agency who specialised in social and environmental impact. Um, it was great. My clients were no longer booze and beauty brands. They were sort of WWF and Greenpeace, which very exciting circle back um so that sort of equipped me with a stepping stone I guess in terms of using the skills I already had in a new way um the third thing I did like Katie though I didn't do a master's I did a course at Cambridge um their sort of sustainability leadership program which I uh did in 2018 I've I become an assessor on so again this was about sort of 
really having the knowledge. I was finding myself in new spaces through this new agency um, where I was talking about climate, talking about the changes we needed to make. And I felt a bit inadequate, actually. I mean, I probably still do. I'm still learning. Like, I'm only five years in. People here have been doing it for 20 years. Um, and so I needed the knowledge just to be able to have the confidence when I was in the room where most of the time people want me to be wrong, uh, to know that I knew my shit and could back it up. Um, so that was that. Um, and then I guess from there, one of the best things I did was sort of think about community. And so this was our pub night. So as Purpose Disruptors, we started as a pub night, basically. And so we gathered together a bunch of people who worked in advertising and marketing. And we met in a pub upstairs in Clerkenwell, all quite speakeasy weirdness. Um, and we got people to sit in circles with pine cones and talk about how it felt to work in advertising, driving consumption at a time when we're in a climate emergency. And how do you deal with the, the tension um, that that brings up? Um, and like, what do you do about that? And we had no answers, just questions. We didn't really know where this was going to lead. We just knew that if we brought people together and we all held questions, maybe something would come of that. Um, it seemed like there was a lot of appetite um, and we ran a sort of climate summit. So we got 100 people together at the Royal Institution, scared the shit out of them with all the climate science and made them sit in circles with pine cones and talk about how they felt about that. Um, most of those people have now gone on to change something and do something differently. Um, and the other thing we did was think about our vision as a, as a company. So um, this was something I drew on my dining table when we all sat together. Um, that was in 2019, I think. Um, and we three co-founders there were four people in the mix at the time we had lots of different ideas but they were all in different directions and the only thing I could think about was what if we could bring them all together and point in one direction and have a clear sort of uh, goal for what we wanted to do so I drew a picture of us on stage at COP26 now remember here I have no no business no idea what I'm doing <laughs> nobody else in advertising is talking about this at all um, and it seemed like a ridiculous idea I didn't even really know if, what COP was actually um, and then obviously it was postponed a year, thankfully, uh, because of COVID. And then this is us on the stage at COP. Um, so we went from a pub with about sort of 20, 30, 40 people um, to being on stage uh, in the green zone on the final day, talking about the role of advertising and marketing in the climate transition. We were the only people from the advertising industry there. Um, still find it a bit weird. Brian Eno was on after us. That was all kinds of strangeness. Um, and uh, the only thing that got us there really was having uh, the imagination to think, what if this was possible? Like, what if we could take this industry and pivot it in a different direction? And that's what we've been trying to do since. Um, and so I guess the thing that I would sort of share in terms of the journey, and I'll come on to some of the work in a second, um, is if, if the sort of role or the project or the business that you kind of want to be involved in doesn't exist, you just have to like imagine it and then create it. Um, and that would be sort of, I guess, my, my sort of advice. Um, I just wanted to talk you through one, a quick project because it helps bring to life the work that we do. Do tell me if I'm running over. I'm going to get a space. Okay. Um, so I guess within Purpose Disruptors, we have a number of different interventions in the system, all based on Don Alvedo's work, which we love. Um, one of them is about creativity. So how do you take the creative superpower of an industry that drives desire and creates culture and shapes society, and how do you like move it in any direction? And our Good Life 2030 project does exactly that. I think the thinking behind it was, what if we could create new stories uh, and images in the world? When we look at what's out there currently, it's either all dystopian and people look away, or it's utopian and people don't believe it. And so what if you could manage to, to find a way to build kind of, you know, new sort of creative ideas that would, that would land for people? As with all these projects, you should start by talking to real people, not a bunch of people in Adland making shit up because that doesn't really work very well. And um, so we did sort of three years of deep qual over sort of a period of time, talking to um, UK citizens who make up the sort of persuadable middle um, and asking them what they dream of for the future. So what does a good life look, to, look like to you in the future? Um, and over all the cohorts, they talked about the same things. They talked about connection over consumption. So what people dream of is a life where they're more connected. Um, and they talk about um, connection to uh, themselves. So having more time to do the things they love, to live with more purpose. These are their images at the time. They talk about connection to each other. Obviously, we're just coming out of the back of 
COVID, so community, family, like building spaces that were kind of shared experiences. And they talk about connection to nature. Um, and I think this was the one that really within the advertising and marketing industry really sparked like creativity. So we put briefs out into the world, we created work, we ran an exhibition at the Tate, we did all kinds of things off the back of this. And connection to nature was one of those things that creators could really like work with. Um, and so uh, last week, <laughs> Kerry, who's starting from row here, and I literally launched uh, a new agency called Agency for Nature. Um, and this was a collaboration with um, a group of people called Glimpse, who are like a creative organisation. Um, and together we brought together people to think about sort of nature connection. Uh, and what we mean by that is sort of, you know, nature connectedness is the extent to which people have a meaningful relationship with the rest of nature and see it as part of their identity. So we were kind of exploring, you know, what does that mean, um, especially in the context of the fact that we are really bad at it in the UK. So we come bottom for nature connection. We also come bottom for biodiversity and well-being. It's no coincidence. They're obviously all linked. Um, and I think one of the stats that I find the most depressing, along with the loss of, you know, nature and hedgehogs and wetlands, was also the loss of words. So the presence of words associated with nature in films, songs and books has declined 63% since the 50s. And that kind of made us really sad as people who work in creativity and culture. And so our question was sort of, like, imagine a world where nature had its own agency. Like, what would that look like? Um, and so that's what we set up. We decided to have some core cool principles. So um, if nature had an agency, it would be resourceful. So making things with what's available. It would be varied, there would be interlocking things, unified things, and it would be collaborative, so not competitive as the industry currently is, but it would bring together an ecosystem based on sort of mutuality and cooperation. And so we went about recruiting five of the top UK advertising um, agencies, and we brought together junior creatives from Widen & Kennedy, Oliver, the Amp Partnership, and Amplify. Um, and we brought them together on a learning journey to create work, um, starting off with obviously a nature-based immersion session at Camley Street Gardens. Um, we got sort of influencers, nature-based people to talk to them about nature. We got them to do exercises where they were thinking about like getting them to draw sort of if nature was talking to you, what would it say? We then took them inside because it was free within it was November um, and gave them the brief. And the creative brief that we wrote for them um, was this. So how do we get 18 to 35 girls in the UK um, who are nature curious, but not exactly Greta, who live in a world that's fast everything, but sense deep down that modern life isn't working for them, to feel that a deeper relationship with nature is the path to re-enchantment. So how do we get them to kind of feel that? And how do we create hype for the slower nature connected lifestyle that we know is needed? We got them to spend lots of time in nature. We got them to, to, to encourage sort of exploring what that meant to them. And then I'm just going to very quickly share um, the five sort of campaigns that came out of the back of that. So the first one was Eco Karma Sutra. Um, and this was from the AM partnership. And the insight here was that if you if you if you create like sort of a relationship between like Earth as a lover, not a mother, you get to a very different place in terms of your relationship with the Earth. So building on the eco-sexual movement, I haven't heard of that before either. Um, it's a thing. Look it up. Um, basically, that is quite a sort of you know earthy version of it. And actually, what we wanted these amazing creators to do was to make it fun and interesting and witty, and it was still erotic. The book is amazing. You can download it. Um, so that was the first idea that came back: a book on eco karma sutra. Um, the second was a campaign, like an outdoor campaign. This is Waterloo Station. Um, and this was from Oliver. And this was all about the idea that um, being in nature is one of those things that transports you to somewhere else. It makes you feel kind of differently. And how do you pull on the sort of psychedelic nature of that, the sort of fractal patterns, like the idea that, that sort of nature is, is sort of psychedelic is like a drug. Um, and so this is their campaign, Nature the Original Trip. We did all of this with donated um, media space. So that was fabulous. The third one from Leo Burnett um, was all about this idea that girl boss is like over. Nobody wants to do this anymore. We don't want to have it all. <laughs> we actually just want to rest, um, and women in particular. And so this was a great sort of copy led um, campaign using. Uh, 
like the lines are so good like don't want to be on the grind just want to lie on the grass it was outdoor kind of all across London and train stations and everywhere but also on social media it got really a lot of traction and was featured in Vogue Business as well um Wyden and Kennedy came up with a gaming idea which to start we were like like nature in games, does that count as actual nature? Like, how does that work? But when you're trying to connect with 18 to 35 year olds who spend a lot of time gaming, you know, there's this whole idea around like touching grass and going outside. So, you know, their insight was what if you could get people who enjoy nature in games to actually engage in that space, like in game, but also, you know, move, move to the outside. So they came up with an incredible idea where they had sort of a live stream of two influencers, gaming influencers, talking about their sort of journey through nature within Guild Wars, which is a, a, a gaming kind of um, platform. And then you could apply to get the seeds in real life to get plant them. So super clever. And the last one, Mamplify was an experiential idea. So their insight was like how people can't find time to be in nature. So how do you bring it to them? So they set up a sort of experiential idea in a park in Shoreditch um, which was linked to sort of your coffee break so you could go on this journey in your coffee break and find um, yeah find this in an urban oasis. Impact has been mad I think actually we thought this was a mad idea and we weren't quite sure how we would do it uh, but with the launch party last week was off the scale we had to sell out 100 people in the room it was amazing you know press articles organic reach out of the day in campaign magazine um, but also, and most importantly, because the actual objective of this, whilst it is lovely to have great creative work out in the world, is to change people. Um, and so our objective really is how do you create change in the people who work in this industry so that they, they go on to create change in everything they do. Um, so this was one from a senior exec creative director. Uh, for years, wanted to give something back to the planet after an entire career self spent promoting products that just take from the planet and leave nothing but waste behind. I would love to connect and help in any way possible. And we were inundated. <laughs> Literally, we can't even get through all the messages. Um, my particular favourite, Tingles Incoming. There have been some admirable efforts from the ad world recently to promote a less consumerist way of living with, I'd say, varying degrees of success. This campaign is landing like a beautiful space rocket made of mushrooms for the past and the future. It's subtle and alluring, not an iota of preachy insight. This. Reach 8.2 million people. Uh, so... Uh, what next? We're resting because we're absolutely broken uh, from launching five campaigns on an event in the space of 12 weeks. Um, hopefully there's going to be some blossoming. The campaigns are still live. They're sort of taking off in the world. Um, and we're starting to think about season two sort of later this year. So do we bring new cohort in? Do we, you know, deepen it with the existing cohort? But what's been really interesting, and I think what I wanted to share with, with this room, is one of the things that we hadn't thought about at the beginning was this idea that it can act as a call and response. So we've been really amazed at the people who've come forward, people like Warp Records, people like academics, you know, saying, can we take this and do something with it in our space? Like this is such a sort of easy to grasp sort of magnetic way of talking about, you know, nature connection and climate and mental health and everything, that what can we do with it? So um, I'll probably leave it there actually, probably at time. Thank you. Yeah. So, any uh, anyone got any questions or reflections? We we normally run till two, but we often sort of just naturally kind of leak over till two thirty. So, if people do need to to head off, that's fine. But yeah, did anyone have any sort of questions they wanted to? ask either of the people or any sort of reflections can we sort of see this as a peer-to-peer -peer space more than anything else I, I mean i'm happy to start if it just sort of helps i mean i actually think um and this will be on my um i hope you don't mind me saying this Lisa, but when when we caught up to chat about what was in the content. There was one little thing you said, which is like, am I regenerative? Like, you know, like, is this, I'm not the right person you should be speaking to for this. I sort of feel like that kind of, um, I don't know, am I, the, am I qualified to do this is quite a common thing that I hear from a lot of people that are trying to get into regeneration or trying to break the mold of like what it means to be more nature connected. Like, 
I don't know if you could just speak a little bit to that. Like, why? What is it that you think personally that, that makes you feel a little bit like you? You know, you're at cop, and Brian Eno is after you and stuff. I'd be interested in your own personal reflection on what it is that makes makes you feel. Like I mean, apart from the systemic issue of being a woman and therefore imposter syndrome being in my blood, <laughs> um, I think it's just all so big. Um, and every time I move forwards in any direction, whether it's like systems change or future thinking or whatever, I'm really conscious that those are areas that I'm sort of new to and dabbling in. And there are lots of people who are experts. And I think the same in the like regenerative space. I'm like that's so vast and deep um and actually i think but i think i'm i've become really comfortable with that actually i think i've realized that the value i bring isn't being an expert in all of those things it's looking at how i can bring the expertise of others or platform others into the spaces that i occupy and the people that i know and the things that i can do with it so i have given up a little bit on being an expert in anything and that's kind of fine, I think. Um, you both spoke, uh, you both had some form of quitting effectively in your stories. And does regeneration, does, does moving into a regenerative practice or identity require a break with the past, do you think? Is there an alternative to that? Or do you have to recognise that you have to leave something behind? Um, sorry, was that to... Yeah, I... Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I was considering this when I was putting it together and I did notice, like, I think, um, as Lisa also said, there's, there's a kind of knock-on-head moment where you kind of realise you you have to you you have to somehow break we need to break out we need to change the system so that requires breaking something and part of that also i think needs to be in in what you're doing you can't just kind of do it on the side it requires also a lot a lot a lot more of you to 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 do it so i think in that sense yes <laughs> i don't know if that helps answer your question I think the thing I would add to that as well is like we're as a society obsessed with never killing anything never letting anything go like I particularly like the sort of Bukhana two loops model which is like you know things have to die and then new things grow um, and in nature you know that's just called composting and so whilst we're always really keen I think as humans to like hold on to everything um, because it has a value um, I think one of the most powerful things was just walking out uh, with no idea, you know, what I would do next. And, you know, I'm also aware, as I'm saying that, there's a level of privilege to that, although not really. I just put the course on my credit card and then worked out how I'd make money to pay it off. So, you know, um, yeah. So I, I think probably, yes, unless you're doing something that can transition, which I, I couldn't see a way that I could go from, inflatable pink flamingos in Miami to the work that I wanted to be doing in the world. That felt like quite a leap. Last thing we had the microphone we could throw. Let's not throw Andy's lovely microphone. Um, so I had, I had a thought and I'm not going to try and build in that previous thought as well because it, and it's the it's the connection ironically in the two talks between um, Katie's identification of just how micro and isolationist economics is. It reduces itself, it reduces itself. It makes you see less. And then and I love the um, Lisa's work on the sort of like, what do people want? They want connections. They want to be able to see all of these different connections, but actually in all of these different ways. And the sort of like, less of the simplification, more of leaning into the entanglement of I am connected to nature, I am connected to others, I'm connected to a community, to a, sort of a, to a place that I work by, a place that I live, a place that the children go to school, wherever it happens to be. And I just think there's maybe, to build in the point now, about sort of like what you have to quit and what you have to let go. But maybe it's about going, 
it's quitting a kind of a very one dimensional idea of your connections of of thinking that and maybe back to Katie's thing about going to go to school go to university get a good job and so on it's like don't see yourself so one dimensionally don't limit the connections that you feel that you have because you are an entanglement the assemblage of all of those things around you is everything and it's like leaning more into that it's, le- it's less of a quitting and more of a, I don't know, just sort of like seeing all of the different layers and going, this is all part of the thing. You have to hold the microphone. Yeah, this is how the magic works. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really interested in the idea of, particularly of looking at advertising as being the thing that shapes our appetites and kind of forms our modes and our ways of being. It's quite nice, the idea of like, you're trying to stimulate a Truman Show moment for everyone in society. And I see that, first of all, connecting to nature could be like a preliminary phase. I just went, ah, man, (laughs) we are part of nature, which is hard to forget in our highly, when we exist in highly artificial urban environments. Um, But yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in kind of what, I suppose you could say, okay, so there's food as, a, as an avenue for then changing appetite. There's architecture, there's built environment. Those are like big drivers. But in terms of actually kind of targeted, you know, it's not, it's, I, I feel like they're much more complex problems for advertising to approach than just like beauty product. I'm going to sell lipstick to someone. It's such a, it's how you, how you identify the opportunity, the kind of, scope of the area that you can intervene in and how to target things effectively within that if that's fundamental to how advertising works quite (laughs) mind-blowing yeah i'm I'm very intrigued by it you're not on the microphone i know yeah i'm gonna well, I've noticed there's a red one flashing on this, so I'm sort of worried that it's going to die at some point. But yeah, I mean, I was going to ask around, like, how difficult it's been ejecting yourself from that, you know, business as usual advertising to, like, you know, the agency for nature thing sounds really exciting, but there's also this, like, worry for me. It's like, oh, like, is there a business model behind there, or are you guys still trying to shape that? And, like, how, you know, how are you getting funding and stuff? Is there, yeah. Do you want to chat a little bit? It's a very good question. Uh, it's very yeah, the money question that I get on every single panel I'm all on. This is all lovely, but what about the money? Yes. Um, so we are funded through philanthropic funding, um, which I didn't even know existed before I started doing this work. Again, it's like, have an idea, follow the energy, and the money will flow. Um, I mean, a funder approached us, like, and we missed their email three times because we didn't really know what we were doing. and We were busy trying to make videos and things um and so somebody came to us and said i've seen what you're doing i think this is a really massive intervention it's unique i've not seen it before and i'd like to give you some money uh and we were like that's very nice but we don't really have a company yet we're just a pub night um and so it sort of came from that for us which i've now realized having tried to raise funding for three years that's almost never happened so um i don't know how anyone would plan for that because i still don't know how she found us she won't tell me Um, And so it's a new model of funding that I didn't know existed. Um, We have been funded for our projects. So, for instance, on the Good Life 2030 project that Kerry works on with me, we've just received core funding for three years, which I don't think I've ever had financial skills like that in my entire career. Um, And that's taken a lot of work and a long time to get to that place. Um, We also have government funding on various different projects. So on the Good Life 2030 project in Ireland, Uh, We're about to launch a campaign out there and the research with citizens and then the creative campaign is is funded by the Irish government. Um, And another piece of our work would advertise emissions, which is not about the creativity, it's about measurements. It's about how do you measure the true emissions from advertising? So if you if you run a campaign that flogs five million BMWs, your footprint isn't how you got to the shoot or like the energy for your office, your footprint is the 5 million like BMWs you just sold and the lifetime emissions of those. Um, so advertising emissions is also now funded 
by the government through a sort of knowledge transfer partnership. So it's new revenue streams. Um, and then Change the Brief Alliance, which is another education platform that we've launched, is commercially funded. So, you know, we have a very deep rooted belief that the ad industry needs to pay for its own transition. Um, it's bloody hard work, I can tell you. Um, but we are sticking with that. So we are part philanthropically, part government, and also part commercially funded. Um, so, yeah, it's not easy. But I think, yeah, there is money. There is money out there in order to help people make this transition. I don't know if I answered it. Well, it's actually <laughs> good when you say, you know, because I've been in part of an agency, not at over, over to, but like you're living by, you know, <laughs> seat of your pants sometimes anyway, even in that industry. So the fact that you can get three years funding, I think is obviously really promising. Any sort of questions online? Or obviously I'm conscious Katie being remote, sometimes it feels a little bit like the, the hybrid people are kind of left out of the room. I wondered if you had, Katie, any reflections on the whole, um, yeah, you know, am I sort of, not am I faking this, but am I, you know, do I, am I entitled to talk about this kind of stuff? I just think that is a story that a lot of people resonate with and are interested in your perspective on it. Um, and also just because I think there's something around what you mentioned around we're all part of this system that kind of keeps us stuck in the the this sort of degenerative mode of being. So you sometimes feel like I guess the 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 media to some extent paint you out to be you have to be sort of this perfect bastion of like angelical perfection and not be doing anything wrong for you to have have some sort of say in this. But the reality is we're all existing in this kind of not corrupt system, but you know, whatever you want to call it, this system that's stopping us from getting there. So um Sorry, I sort of hijacked the, the question. But yeah, I wonder what your, your thoughts on it were, Katie. On the kind of imposter syndrome, can I talk about this? Yeah, or maybe you don't get it. I don't know. Like, just curious to know if you would. No, yeah. No, I, I certainly, I think I, like we all suffer from imposter syndrome and maybe women more than men. So, in fact, I, I, we actually, I talk about this a lot with the fellows that I helped through the programme, which we met on, Andy, a couple of years ago. So one of my education roles is, is helping people understand the crisis and then find kind of their role in it. And everyone has that same feeling like, well, I don't know enough and... And, um, you know, so I, so I can't go out and start doing anything. And I think the one thing is that, well, we don't really have time <laughs> to, to, all, to get a handle on it. And it is so massive and it's so interconnected. And the more, I mean, the more I learn about economics in particular, I've got a particular passion for getting more, especially more women and diverse voices into economics. It's kind of one of the goals that I've set myself because, um, I was one of the only women in my class in in, in university uh, in economics. It has a huge still uh, gender diversity problem. Uh, problem mainstream economics hasn't figured out quite why that might be, unfortunately. But you know, and I think that, um, and I often hear, oh, I, I was totally turned off by looking at economics because I didn't, you know, I, I didn't really get it. It was really abstract, and so I, particularly we hear that from women. There's a sort of self selection bias, and that is that has fed into you know maintaining this kind of system. So. I kind of quite often I'm trying to put forward the fact that well actually the economics the economists that are kind of in charge right now and that are maintaining this status quo they've got it wrong so you don't need to feel like you don't know you probably if you if you understand the basics of systems thinking I think you understand the economy much better and you probably understand the crisis much better even than a lot of people that are working in climate and and these areas because there we we do have this reductionist we learn it in school we you know we 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 have divided system we do have divided subjects we don't learn in an interdisciplinary way so a lot of people approach it. i mean many people talk about just the climate crisis or just decarbonizing or and they're not making the connection with nature which is which was so great to hear i didn't know what the topic was going to be today so it was great to, to hear that overlap because i've also come to find that that's important so yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a long answer, but I think uh, hopefully, um, you know, as I said, we don't really have the time and, and uh, I'm pretty sure that everyone's got a role that they can play. Want a question? I know. Oh yeah, John, did you have an additional? Yeah. I, I was just adding in about, Mike was really far away now, I'll just be loud. Can you uh, hear him? Can you hear him anyway online? Yes, yeah, I can read to, yes, go. Oh, oh well, there we go. We don't need so, to pass it around then. All right, well, fine. Um, so, no, I was just really interested in talking about the, have you taken any particular approaches to breaking down the skills 
you learned before and applying them in new ways. Because I think that then becomes relevant for everyone on that transition. Yeah. Um, yes, definitely. I actually was, I actually had a, I didn't, I was worried that I was going to have too many slides. So I cut some stuff out that I've used before, but I actually was, I work very much with the with the climate then or the then of, of where you, where you are and bringing in the skills. So I've, I've worked with that myself. And I also, I always advocate for, for others to do that. So in my case, you know, I was already doing a lot of research, a lot of writing. I was a consultant. I was fairly good at convincing people. I'm fairly good at getting people on board. And I've tried to use those skills very much so in, in my transition. So I think it always makes sense to start out there. Um, and that also kind of helps, I think, with the imposter system, syndrome, because if you're already kind of confident with the skills and what you do, then you're just applying them to a new area. You're not also trying to learn a whole bunch of new and new skills, if that makes sense. Uh, not a question, but more, more just a comment for Lisa, just to say how much I liked the um, nature agency concept. I am on the purpose for disruptors newsletter, so I've, so I've seen it through the air. And actually, I came to that event you mentioned with Pine Cones, I was at oh, one at the um, Royal Society. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just loved it, and I did actually see it in Blackfriars Station on Friday as well. So the, yeah, yeah, so they are upholding the, the promise. Um, but it made me think about I, I don't know about everybody in the room here, but the more of these events and things that I go to, the more I read everything. There just seems to be interconnected things everywhere. I hear somebody talk about something, but I think I saw that the other day. But um, I'm reading a book at the moment called Citizens by John Alexander, if you know it. Yeah, and that know. whole nature agency uh, concept just made me think about that. And, and taking that sits of mind mindset, be the way of the consumer mindset, and all that stuff. And I just, uh, yeah, just wanted to say how much I love it. Oh, thank yeah, you. It was great. It's really it's nice. nice. Um, yeah, John's a really good friend of ours, John Alexander. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, at our FA Summit last year, um, I actually uh, hosted Ryan and John Alexander because <laughs> having missed him at COP because I couldn't stay on afterwards. I decided that he would definitely, at some stage, be my friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so we booked we booked the tape for the other day something. Trying to work out how we get a ticket. The <laughs> idea was if you get someone really big, in, then they'll pay the ticket. Yeah. So yeah, John Alexander, Brian Eno wrote the forward to John Alexander's book. So this probably have a favorite. Yeah. That. But that um, yeah, citizens and the whole. Kind of shift towards that is such an important mindset shift for people in advertising and marketing because you just grow up. I mean, like Katie, I did business studies, even though I loved art and music, <laughs> because I was like, I need to make money because that's what Thatcher says we all should do. Um, but what's interesting is you grow up talking about consumers. Like my entire career has been segmented, targeting, like, blah, 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 like consumers, and it's such a weird shift that like you watch people in our industry go through that sort of mental gymnastics like oh hang on a minute so, so citizens they have agency outside of the things they buy and they're not just the products they buy but they're actually in their own right and it's it's such an important reframing yeah. there's a lot more to jobs work than that but from, from the industry that's mm -hmm. the thing but we see big the first shift yeah and um, myself and um a colleague are going on his course so. It's called the New Citizen Project, oh. I believe, and it's all just about building on top of that, that change of mindset. Um, yeah, I can send them around the details. Well, we're at, we're at time, everyone. Obviously, you're welcome to stay and keep keep chatting, but if you do need to head off, this is kind of the fall. Just one quick plug for, because Katie didn't really kind of make a big deal of it, but the Tipping Points podcast she's done is excellent. I don't know how many people are, uh, are aware of Limits to Growth, even. Actually, just to show of hands, are people, are people aware of Limits to Growth? Yeah, yeah, like a fairly decent show. Well, Katie did a three part podcast that talks about talks about three, a lot of detail. I don't know what to listen to. It's brilliant. Uh, give, you know, five star ratings of what we say. But yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And like I say, we'll, we'll be keep an eye out for a, another event that's probably going to happen at the end of next month. I don't know if John got a specific date yet or anything. I was thinking Thursday the 28th. Well, yeah. Maybe the Thursday the 28th. Well, that's just me thinking. Right. Thank you very much.